Thank you, Dr. Ashu, for giving me this opportunity. Till now, I think uh, we have covered uh, the basic thing and the need for correcting the astigmatism and the beautiful way depicted by Dr. Bharti, how we can do LRI and astigmatic keratotomy. So I will be covering the talk on uh, toric eye walls, an elegant way to control the astigmatism. So uh, we all know that uh, the astigmatism is the important part of uh, the visual refraction. So if it is not properly corrected, the chances of <coughs> uh, the quality of vision cannot be as crisp as it is without the astigmatism. This slide shows that even small amounts of astigmatism can impact the visual acuity. <coughs> so uh, even uh, in this table, you can see very easily that this is uh, with zero astigmatism. And at infinite, infinity, the patient's vision is 20 by 20. And even if there is a 0 0.05 diopter of astigmatism, the vision can come down to 20, 25. And with uh, one diopter of astigmatism, it will be as low as 20 by 40. So an astigmatism of one diopter or below is the aim at which we should we should target and we should start correcting it. This is what I have learned from my, and if it is less than that, then we should not aim to correct it. So toric IOL, as the title is, it's an elegant way and it is an established way of correcting and most scientific way of correcting the astigmatism. And various studies have been done uh, till now, and we are doing it for last almost uh, 12 to 15 years. And uh, with the toric IL, there is definite improvement in the visual outcomes. There is a better quality of vision, less post-operative refractive astigmatism has been proven, high ratings for clarity of vision, with greater spectacle independence for distance, and there is a high patient satisfaction with toric IOLs after surgery. The good part is that as has been depicted earlier and has been said earlier that there is a regression with the other, uh, uh, other methods. Like if we correct it with the incisions, we cannot correct it more or the more amount of astigmatism, more than one diopter of astigmatism cannot be corrected. Or if we do LRI or astigmatic keratotomy, we cannot correct more amount of astigmatism. The other important fact is that you are not sure of how much you are going to correct because it depends on, there are multiple variable factors on which it depends the outcome. And there is definitely a regression of the regression of the uh, the result with the period of time. But with toric IOLs, it's not like that. Once you have corrected, it will always remain like, like, the, like the same unless there is some pathology in the cornea which is causing the, or your patient selection has not been good. So this is what it is. My present scope will include a pre-operative assessment of the case, an intraoperative pulse, how we can we should do it successfully, and the post-operative surprise corrections. All these things I will be uh, discussing in my talks. Points to ponder are how well is the uh, case selection? We should understand the patient expectations, what the patient wants. As has been already sp uh, said by my previous speaker, that this is an expensive mechanism as compared to other tools by which we are correcting. So when the cost is involved, the patient's expectations are also increased and enhanced. So for that, we need to do a proper counseling of the patient, a proper counseling. And we should always under uh, say and give a better or more results. This is what my way of working is. So do under promise Say that maybe you, if it is the if the astigmatism is two and a half diopters, three and a half diopters, four diopters or so, then we should always explain to the patient maybe that you may require some number, but definitely we will correct it, and uh, uh, the major part of the astigmatism will definitely be corrected. 
A careful patient examination is very, very important, which we'll be discussing in the uh, uh, commencing talk. And uh, in that, if there is a epithelial basement dystrophy, or uh, then we should treat it. And other related treatable corneal irregularities like pterygium or uh, other things should be corrected before the surgery is planned, cataract surgery is planned or refractive surgery is planned. And at least one to four months is should be given for the previous surgery for which with for this maybe salesman nodule or maybe the epithelial basement dystrophy or maybe pterygium which has been corrected before then all these things should be done and the and an interval of one to three to four months should be there in between treat ocular surface disorders and mevimine gland disorders before taking the patient for the surgery Look for any other corneal disease like Salzman nodule, any presence of scar, radial keratotomy, PRK or LASIK before, and uh, any presence of uh, the uh, epithelial nest in the flap of the LASIK, etc. Coming to that uh, accurate pre-operative testing of cylindrical power and nesting and axis, this is the most important thing. I remember we have to correct only, we, we, one should remember that we have to treat only the corneal astigmatism. So for that, many times I have seen there is a patient comes with the acceptance of three diapters, four diapters of astigmatism, but on a, doing a topography or doing a corneal astigmatism by keratometry, we see that the astigmatism is not that much. So look for other causes of astigmatism like uh, which are more common is like uh, lenticular astigmatisms due to subluxation, due to the nuclear sclerosis, due to the presence of irregular nuclear sclerosis, due to the presence of lenticonas, or many other things can be there, which can cause uh, the astigmatism to the patient, effective astigmatism, but it is not a corneal astigmatism. The other important fact is that apart from the uh, the power, we have to look at the axis of the uh, uh, cylinder and we recommend toric IL in a case of pre-operative astigmatism, which is more than one diapter. If it is less than one diapter, the previously enumerated methods are more effective and we should not do it. Do the toric IL in such cases. A potential candidate for toric IL would have regular symmetrical corneal astigmatism. This is very, very important thing should, which has to be carried upon in the mind because not all cases are the candidate for potential candidate for the toric IL or astigmatism correction. Patients with irregular astigmatism will not improve with toric IL, mind it. And rather it may worsen if there is a high irregularity. There are three steps for toric IL implantation. One is accurate pre-operative testing of cylindrical power and axis. Second is the marking of the axis on the eye, both pre and intraoperatively. Then last is the uh, this marking can be either digital or by manual method, which we'll be sharing in the commencing slide. And last will be the intraoperative alignment of the IL into the desired axis as has been given by the lens uh, supplier. Any error in any of the steps mentioned above will lead to poor results or residual astigmatism. Coming to the first step, that is the preoperative planning. We should perform keratometry and make sure there is a corneal astigmatism. Perform topography. Come, so perform keratometry by various uh, by various uh, tools like uh, uh, automated keratometry or by the manual keratometer or maybe the IUL master or the the digital or marking of uh, digital calculation of the IL power which will tell us about the correct axis and uh, power of the astigmatism. Now, uh, what I have seen is that uh, the Lenstar, IL Master and other now good gadgets have come which uh, tell us about the keratometry. 
some give us a over result like in linstar give us 0.12 to 0.25 diopters of over correction of the over estimation of the astigmatism but definitely the axis given by these uh, um, these uh, tools are very very reliable then we should perform topography in all these cases we should confirm the astigmatism axis by topography topographer will inform us the location of the steep meridian and its axis and if the astigmatism whether the astigmatism is regular and whether the astigmatism is symmetrical these all things will tell us and lastly it will tell us about the presence or absence of dry eye so all these things are important to be seen in when we do topography perform a posterior corneal measurement with the shimflak imaging uh, tools like the pentacam and galilee we can rely on manual or, or we don't have all these tools available to with us so we can do a manual or automated refractive keratometries and they are reliable also but we should check it again we should confirm it again and uh, on an, another day when the cornea has not been touched by any instrument or uh, by any medicine or the il master or lens star for the magnet we can use il master or lens star which are really very very reliable for the magnitude of the cylinder before moving ahead we must confirm it with multiple measurements this is very important and in toric il it is all the more important for 1 1.25 diopters of with the rule astigmatism we may use on axis incisions rather than a toric il this is because we, we we if we use on axis or a paired incision or coupling a couple incisions on opposite axis on the steep meridian that will correct to up to 0.5 to up 0.75 diopters of astigmatism this much as we we might get it correction so with the rule astigmatism which is uh, planned that uh, we should under correct with the rule astigmatism this is, should be kept in mind and over correct or fully correct the against the rule astigmatism so with this 1.25 or 1 diopters of with the rule astigmatism we may use on axis incision rather than a toric il when results from two instruments do not agree at the axis and magnitude of astigmatism if reading from manual k and pentacap uh, pentacam topographer are not within 10 degrees then repeat both after calling patient again and if still they are not varying or they are not coinciding and there should not be a difference or variation in axis of 5 to 10 degrees then this is beyond this it is not acceptable use the magnitude of astigmatism or of both manual or automated k and axis derived from the topography or pentacam so if they are not matching then we should defer toric il in such a case when the two when two readings or multiple readings from the two instruments they are not matching in terms of axis and the magnitude of cylinder coming to the another important aspect of seeing the corneal astigmatism the you the role of posterior corneal curvature cannot be undermined or underestimated posterior cornea is a vertically steep in about 87% of the eyes and this causes a net against the rule astigmatism as the back cornea is a minus cylinder or a concave lens a minus lens or a concave lens and this causes an opposite effect so this causes a net against the rule astigmatism this results in over correction of the with the rule astigmatism by 0.5 diopters and correction under correction of against the rule astigmatism by 0.3 diopters so therefore slightly under correct with, with the rule astigmatism and fully or slightly over correct against the rule astigmatism and if you are using posterior accurate ideal is to use accurately measured posterior corneal astigmatism by pentacam or galilee or any shimflug imaging instruments then <coughs> uh, surgically induced astigmatism has been covered by, by dr bharti also it depends on incision length and there is a and the incision location there is a patient variability and measurement variability both 
So patient variability depends on the how much deep you have done and what is the uh, the density of the cornea or tens tensile strength of the cornea, which various instruments can tell us. But usually it is uh, uh, not much reliable. So what is the best way to calculate surgically induced astigmatism has been very well um, uh, said by Dr. Ashu also. We should use a siacalculator.com site or we may use Saurav uh, Chaudhary's site to calculate uh, um, our surgically induced astigmatism. And one should clearly know and anticipate. My surgically induced astigmatism is uh, all, uh, 0.25 diopters to 0.30 diopters. So in my cases, I am having this much of astigmatism. And you should calculate on same type of uh, incision length, same width of incision, which you mark and uh, on various lens uh, uh, types and uh, on, on uh, only one single particular type of uh, lens which is you are using and at least 30 to 100 cases if you register then you will get a good uh, uh, estimation of the surgically induced astigmatism. Coming to another important aspect which is a centroid value in calculating surgically induced astigmatism. In this particular say, we have this thing, single or double angle plots will give us the uh, pre-operative astigmatism calculation. It takes into account vector magnitude and orientation. Centroid is the average of these vectors and represents the mean surgically induced astigmatism. Based on averages, a 0 0.10 diopter may be in a good estimate of average centroid induced astigmatism based on a 2.4 millimeter clear corneal incision. The recent Barrett formula takes into account the central centroid value in calculating the surgically induced astigmatism. The barrett tori algorithm is very good and a superior refractive predictability versus other formulas and nomogram over, as you can see, when we use uh, the other formulas, the Barrett formula calculator gives us almost 75% per prediction of residual astigmatism. And there is a superior refractive predictability as compared to other formulas. So I use Barrett toric formula for calculation of the IOL power and toric plan of toric IOL. Coming to the marking, reference marking on the eye. This could be done in a manual way. As you can see here, we can do it on slit lamp. Uh, same patient can be asked to slit uh, to sit on the uh, keep a chin on the slit lamp and keeping the um, the hack stride slit lamp in a horizontal meridian. So you can mark with the free hand on uh, on, on a horizontal meridian at uh, three and nine o'clock position, keeping the chin and head straight and. Uh, and uh, touching the uh, forehead to the uh, strip of the slit lamp and asking the patient to look straight into the right ear, into the ear of your eye, of yourself. And uh, this will focus and this will give us a marking as you can see here. And this is on, uh, uh, where these are the marks which we have made pre-operatively. And uh, this is the mark which we have to make at uh, 90 degree. Or we can have a bubble, we can use a bubble marker, uh, freehand bubble marker. This is, and the bubble should be within two lines here. So this is another way of marking. And maybe we can use electronic preoperative marker like this. Coming to the digital marking systems, which are available from Alcon, which is in, by the name of Varion. I don't have any financial interest in any of these uh, methods or products uh, shown over here. Or maybe uh, there is a Callisto uh, from Zeiss. And uh, this will, uh, in this, a patient is asked to sit pre-op and the pre-op registration of the patient is done. And uh, marking, uh, it is not, uh, there is no physical marking, but it records it. Uh, the image of the patient's vessels are recorded and uh, this will guide us. And uh, the, the, by this, the patient's landmarks are guided. And accordingly, the, uh, the, when the patient is in a supine position from the sitting position, it takes into account the, the changes in variation in the marking. Then comes uh, the, we have to send the axis and uh, 
uh, the amount of cylinder and the IL power to the company, exit length and all to the company. And uh, or maybe we can do it ourselves. And this tells us that the patient is having plus 3.22 diopters of cylinder at 94 degree axis. And the recommended IL power is T6 model of Falcon IL power, which will give us a residual cylinder of 0.16 diopters. And this will tell us what will be the axis of incision where you are going to place the incision, which is in this particular case at zero degree. And which this is the uh, line uh, which tells us where the cylinder or the lens axis uh, has to be aligned with. So this is a case This will where there is a patient is uh, pre-operative marking as you have seen. I have done a cataract surgery. I'm not showing that part. And after polishing of the Australia capsule thoroughly. Uh, I don't have any financial interest in this. A lens is placed inside the bag. This is a toric lens and it is a no uh, visco uh, implantation, which is very, very helpful in uh, implanting the lens because it, with this, the change in the axis in the immediate post-op period is not there. If we leave uh, some amount of uh, viscoelastic in the bag. So now with the bimanual technique, I'm rotating the lens and this is the axis, intended axis at which the lens has to be placed. And uh, I'm, I've placed it here and it is accurately being placed at the particular, in the particular meridian, as you can see in this particular fixing of the image. So manual and digital marking, there are various studies which shall tell us that the digital marking group shows stat statistically significant better refractive outcomes as regard the mean deviation from target which was 0 0.10 plus 0 0.08 diopters and all eyes were within 0 0.5 diopters of the targeted induced astigmatism. The digital marking group showed statistically significant better results as regards the mean post-operative toric IOL misalignment measured by the slit length, which was 2.4 diopter degrees plus minus 1.96 degree. The reported mean post-operative toric IOL misalignment ranged from 2.5 degree to 4, uh, to 4 diopters. So this was the difference. And another case, wherein the axis uh, was 64 degree where the lens has to be placed in digital marking and uh, incision was at uh, 180 degree as you can see here. So in, we have made an incision at 180 degree and we are going to implant the lens at 64 degree axis. This is the axis where we have to align the lens set, but which and dear friends, it is not necessary that we all should have a toric, uh, uh, the digital marking system. You can see uh, the image here and the <clears throat> astigmatism preoperative was 2.23 diopters and after postoperatively it has come down to zero, zero diopters. And there is a, a lens is perfectly at 60 degree as was planned. And this is how we do intraoperative marking of the by the Mendel's marker. These are the marks which we used to do earlier. And this is how the lens is being aligned. And, and uh, this is without the digital marking, which, which we used to do 10 years back. And uh, in this particular case, there was a residual uh, astigmatism of 0 0.50 diopters at 1 de 180 degree. So top considerations in success of toric oil prediction is the topographer is recommended to confirm the location of the steep meridian if it is regular astigmatism and symmetrical astigmatism. We should consider using a second instrument to maybe in the form of topographer or varion itself or maybe the pentacan or another IL calculating machine to, uh, to validate the location of the steep meridian. Use keratometer, biometer, 
to calculate power difference between the principal meridian. Topography to confirm the power difference. Include posterior corneal astigmatism in calculations by using an advanced calculator. Optimize surgically induced astigmatism, a centroid value of 0 0.10. Consider whether overcorrection to with the rule astigmatism is warranted for patients with against the rule astigmatism and oblique astigmatism and try no visco IL implantation for better results. Coming to the correction of the restrial astigmatism, if it comes, so in, which can be due to the incorrect IOL power calculation at the corneal plane, there is a role of posterior corneal curvature which has not been taken into, into consideration in calculation of the IOL power and cylindrical power. There is disaccordance in cylinder axis between various instruments and still we have gone ahead and uh, we have planned a uh, toric IOL. And surgery did not go your way like poor's creation of incision, etc. Incision formation was not correct. And sometimes there are unexplained reasons for the, uh, the <coughs> presence of residual astigmatism. <coughs> so we should understand the, the cause of residual refractive error or residual sphere, whether it is uh, re refractive error or cylindrical error. So if it comes to be a spherical, or cylinder or a spherical cylinder. What kind of refractive error is? So if it is spherical, then their IL power calculation is incorrect. If it is purely cylindrical, then your calculation of cylindrical power is not correct. If it is spherical cylindrical, then you should think the whether the, uh, you should dilate, check after dilatation, whether the IL axis is on the meridian in which we have planned. Get the formula from the sheet and see whether the IUL is placed on the intended axle where we have planted, implanted during the surgery. Sometimes the haptic R both, uh, is not in the bag and that can also lead to this. Now in this particular case, we have planned pre-operative um, Zeiss Acrylisa Toric IUL and uh, the intended axis was 160 degree where we have to plan and the incision location was 60 zero degree sorry so so we have done the surgery and uh, our axis at uh, uh, incision location is 180 degree the this is a plate haptic iul so iul is placed in the bag and we are finally placing it this is a toric trifocal iul and axis of placement is 160 degree. As you can see with the Varion, we are aligning it at 160 degree. It is perfectly aligned at the end of the surgery. So after the incisions are hydrated, we check it again. And now very next day, the, the patient vision was 66 and the patient didn't had any complaint. But after a period of 10 days, patient came to us, returned to us after a period of one week and with the vision of 6 by 24. And the refraction was plus 0 0.5 diopter with minus 2.5 diopters of cylindrical power at 75 degree axis. And vision was improving to 6 by 9 and N6. So this is on a dilatation, we saw that the patient's IUL has been displaced. The axis has been, uh, the IUL has been rotated. So we waited for the initial incisions to get uh, stabilized. And there is, if there is any other reason, then after one, one month, we took uh, the patient to the OR and repositioned the IUL. As you can see here, yeah, the IUL now is at 90 degree meridian. This is the zero and 180 degree meridian. The IUL was at almost at 90, 94 degree. So with the help of spatula, by using, fixing the, by uh, filling the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, appropriate viscoelastic, I'm rotating the lens, dialing the lens, and we have to place it at 160 degree. So we can, because this is a plate haptic um, lens, so we can rotate in opposite direction also, anti-clockwise direction. And now, Maybe there was a residual uh, uh, viscoelastic behind the lens, which was the reason why the lens rotated, or maybe we must have, we might have overhydrated the anterior chamber. So there is a chance that uh, the lens gets 
that rotated in the back. So important thing which has to be kept in mind when we close the incision when uh, and when we hydrate the incision that uh, the chamber should not be very deep. It, the uh, eye should not be over hydrated and. Uh, the 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 incisions there should not be leaking incisions otherwise there is a chance of shallowing of the anterior chamber and the lens can get rotated in the immediate post operative period so friends we if um, there is still a astigmatism is present we can go to this site and uh, check the for the residual refractive error and if we can we have to enter the amount of residual refractive error and the IL model which we have used and it will give us the new toric IL axis if it is correct incorrectly correct uh, uh, calculated beforehand the new toric IL axis and then we can realign the lens at this particular IL and give good quality of vision after rotating the IL to the normal axis. So other options are we can use examer laser correction with LASIK laser or PRK or we may use a LRI which are less reliable. Finally, to con conclude, toric IL for one diopter and above against the rule astigmatism can be uh, considered and uh, with 1 to 1.25 diopters of with the rule astigmatism, I use an on axis or paired incision. Otherwise, more than 1.25 diopters of Vidurul astigmatism, we can plan for toric IUL. Intrastromal LRI or arcuate incisions by femtosecond laser is another good option for less than one diopters or 0.75 diopters of astigmatism. There is less dry eye, wound gap, and better, better predictability, which we can convert into penetrating LRI or arcuate incision. Adding toric IOL to your surgical armamentarium is the most effective way to enter into refractive cat cataract surgery and making your patient give you get the wow factor and give you blessings and good wishes. Thank you.